Welcome back everyone to the Underground Church Channel. Today I'm going to share with you guys two of the most important resources that I have, okay? First, the soteriological impact of Augustine's change from premillennialism to amillennialism. That means salvation doctrine change, folks, okay? So, when Augustine switched from a premillennial view of eschatology to amillennialism, it affected his interpretation of Matthew 24, He who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. He backloaded this into the church age and made it a prerequisite for salvation. And many people today, including the reformers, in fact, let's go to page 7 of this article if I can remember correctly. By the time the reformers appear on the stage of history, eschatology was a dead issue. Folks, let's be honest here. Neo-reformers have been on the rise in the past multiple, multiple decades, replacing dispensationalism as the dominant view in the church. Most new pastors today have no idea about this, okay? So, we see here that Augustine's soteriology changed by doing what? He reinterpreted the gospel of the kingdom, he who endures to the end shall be saved. If you've seen our recent video, you know that the gospel of the kingdom was offering Israel their prophesied kingdom from the Old Testament, which is still to come in the future. But in the meantime, we have this parenthesis going on, this parenthetical period we call the church age, right? When the body of Christ is raptured out, that is when the gospel of the kingdom returns. All dispensationalists really should know this. I don't know what's going on today in the realm of Christian scholarship, but let me tell you this as a fact, folks. They are falling way behind the standard of scholarship in other fields. That is a fact, okay? And now we're going to come over here to this article. I've already shared this with you guys before, but today I'm going to go point by point on some of the most important points within the article, because I know many people are not going to read this because they're too biased and they don't understand professional analysis when they see it. They're just leaning back on their professional idiots out there. I said it. So these are the different manuscripts that go into the translation of your Bible version. We got the Byzantine text type here. We have more manuscripts of the Byzantine text type by far than the other two families combined. The other two families being Western text type and Alexandrian text type. All new versions are leaning heavily on the Alexandrian text type ever since the days of Westcott and Hort. And the results, the new versions that are being pumped out, have not changed much at all since the times of Westcott and Hort. So despite what any contemporary scholar might try to say... You look at the results, folks, and the results are that the new versions haven't changed that much at all from that time. So let's go back and see what happened. I'm going to read a couple of the key points here, and I'm going to leave a link in the description below for both of these articles so that you guys can take a look at this for yourself. We got critical text theory, a.k.a. reasoned eclecticism. This is the contemporary method used today. And by the way, the person who wrote this article, this is a very unbiased article I'm giving you because the person who wrote this article is in favor of reasoned eclecticism, but he recognizes that it has major problems. So let's read what happened. Westcott and Hort, when they started bringing this critical text in to understand why they didn't use any of the Byzantine readings, which is the vast majority of the manuscripts we have today. They didn't use this, guys. They preferred every time you found a reading where one was Byzantine from the majority and one was Alexandrian, right? Which is associated typically with what? The school at Alexandria, Egypt, from which came a lot of allegorical interpretation of the scriptures and much heresy that even influenced later on different sects like the Jehovah's Witnesses. To understand why they didn't use any of the majority readings, we need to look at their third rule. They thought that the Byzantine text type was a combination of the Alexandrian and the Western text types. More recent manuscript findings have proved this wrong, but more on that later. Westcott and Hort thought the Byzantine text family resulted from some scribes combining the other two text types to try and get closer to the original document. Remember the rules. If the Byzantine text type was a combination of the Alexandrian and Western text types, and if combination manuscripts were always later, rule number three, and if earlier is better, this is the stupidest rule, and it's rule number one. Just because you have an earlier manuscript doesn't mean it's better, folks. 
Obviously not. If you have an early manuscript that's garbage, you're not going to use that one over a manuscript that is better. But what do they conclude here? Then the Byzantine text type should be ignored as a latter, less authentic text type. So we have over 5,000 Byzantine type manuscripts and somewhere around 60 Alexandrian manuscripts. And they're preferring those over the 5,000 majority. All distinctively Syrian or Byzantine readings must be at once rejected, Westcott and Hort. Again, in the last 100 plus years, we've found manuscripts that prove the Byzantine text type is not a combination of the Western and Alexandrian text types. Unfortunately, this bias against Byzantine readings persisted until later to Allen. In a similar vein, Kirk Allen considers Greek manuscripts which are purely or predominantly Byzantine to be irrelevant for textual criticism. Look how stupid that statement is, because the vast majority of the manuscripts we have, which are only from a century or a few centuries later than the Alexandrian text type, which, you know what, let's take a look at the Alexandrian text type right now disastrous, right? Utter disaster. Amateurs in the faith today, folks. Amateurs in the faith. These men don't know spiritual war. Don't tell me you know what that is. Don't even step to me and tell me you know what that is, little boys and girls. Let's see what we got here. Okay, so of course we all know this. If you're a scholar, then you know this anyways. Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiaticus. We got Codex B and Codex Aleph. They said that any place where these two manuscripts agreed, which was actually not all the time, they're different from each other as well, should be accepted as the true readings until strong internal evidence is found to the contrary. Now, folks, so we know that Erasmus rejected Vaticanus. That's why, that's one of the major reasons why, in addition to the brilliance and the genius of the King James translators, the king called the best from all the land, folks. He's not going to call amateurs, okay? So, the king called the best from all the land, and they translated the King James Bible. These guys have the exact opposite approach. Dean Bergen knew this. He was writing about how you can't be on the fence on this issue. You're either going to lean one way or the other. There's no magical, eclectic text, folks, that they've come up with. They're trying to feed you this nonsense, this BS that they're trying to feed the church today, which is that we've discovered more manuscripts now. That's why they're better. That's why we have a more accurate translation. No, those people are lying to your face. Let's scroll down here, right? That's not true. So what does it say here? In fact, when you see a Bible footnote that says the earliest and best manuscripts, they are almost universally talking about these two manuscripts and only these two manuscripts. Please remember that. It is no exaggeration to say that Codex B and Codex Aleph are the foundation for virtually all modern New Testament Bible translations. So where did they find Codex Sinaiaticus? Let's read Tischendorf's account of finding it in his own words. It was found at the foot of Mount Sinai, but watch this, folks, in visiting the library of the monastery in the month of May 1844, I perceived in the middle of the great hall a large and wide basket full of old parchments, and the librarian, who was a man of information, told me that two heaps of papers like these, moldered by time, had been already committed to the flames. What was my surprise to find amid this heap of papers a considerable number of sheets of a copy of the Old Testament in Greek, which seemed to me to be one of the most ancient that I had ever seen. Oh, it's older. It must be better even though two heaps of papers just like this were committed to the flames. Now, this guy's unbiased, so what does he conclude? He says, so no, the entire Codex Sinaiaticus wasn't going to be burned because the entire Codex Sinaiaticus was not in that most likely trash heap. Okay, but how do we know that it's trash, folks? It's not just because we're guessing that it was committed to the trash, right? Now, about the quality of Codex Sinaiaticus, even those who love the manuscript will admit it has serious quality problems. Even the official Codex Sinaiaticus Project website admits this. No other early manuscript of the Christian Bible has been so extensively corrected. That's all you need. That's all you need right there. I don't need to read anything else. Are you kidding me? Once again, folks, what the scribes had to do was take a manuscript and simply copy it over word for word. 
That's the same thing as if a child gets punished and you have them writing lines over and over again. They're just copying the same line over. You know, I will not throw an eraser at the back of the teacher's head. I will not throw an eraser at the back of the teacher's head. That's pretty much what they're doing, folks. They're just copying an existing writing. They don't have to think that hard. They're not creative writing their own manuscript, obviously, right? All they're doing is they're taking an existing manuscript. They're taking a blank page and just copying it on over. Therefore, when you read something like this, no other early manuscript of the Christian Bible has been so extensively corrected. Goodness gracious, guys, this is junk. If you have 5,000 plus manuscripts in the majority, and then you have a manuscript that has survived a little bit longer, that is tied to the heretical school over there at Alexandria, Egypt, and it's been extensively corrected, let's scroll down and see just how much. Look at this. The New Testament is extremely unreliable. It says right here, 14,800 alterations and corrections in Sinaiticus, Tischendorf says. He goes on to say, on many occasions, 10, 20, 30, 40 words are dropped. Letters, words, even whole sentences are frequently written twice over or begun and immediately canceled. That gross blunder whereby a clause is omitted because it happens to end in the same word as the clause preceding occurs no less than 115 times in the New Testament. By any conceivable metric, except age, Codex Sinaiticus is one of the worst manuscripts that we've found. You probably couldn't find a scholar who would praise the scribal work in Sinaiticus and it's easy to find those who would deride it as the worst scribal work among the manuscripts we found. So if there's any progressive revelation in dispensationalism, who do you think God is going to be giving that to? The people who are using these junk new versions? I don't think so. I'm sorry to say this because I don't think so. It's going to be those who defended and stayed faithful to his word. Did you know that if you add up all of the words that were removed from your new versions, it totals up to be the equivalent of you removing not only 1 Peter, but pretty much all of 2 Peter from your entire Bible. Yeah, and we know this because the Byzantine text type is significantly longer than the Alexandrian text type. So the scholars are thinking that, oh, the Byzantine text type, this 5,000 plus majority that we have, those are all forgeries. Because at some point in time, somebody sat down and decided to add all of those words to the Bible, which are words that support orthodox doctrine. Yeah, like that makes sense, right? Why would a heretic add words to the Bible to support orthodox doctrine? They would try to corrupt the doctrines, which is what happens actually when you remove words, which is much easier to do. It's much easier to erase, simply just erase a little part of a sentence here and it becomes something heretical than it is to sit there and think and go, how am I going to like insert this into the middle in between these two sentences here, have it make sense so it still flows into the next sentence and have it be supporting my heretical doctrine since I'm a heretic. As we know, only heretics would have the motive to do that, right? If you're somebody who is not a heretic, then you're not going to touch or change the words of God because you believe they're the words of God. Only a heretic would have the motive of actually adding to the word of God. And therefore, what would they be adding? Something to change the doctrine itself or something of the sort. They would not be adding something to help strengthen the doctrine that doesn't make it. There's no motive there. See, these folks, modern scholars apparently don't know how to think. OK, they just sat at a desk for four to eight years, regurgitated some wooden nonsense that they read in a textbook back onto a test paper or into an essay format. That's basically the extent of your modern day scholar. So with that, folks, that's all I've got to say. Look out for the finale coming soon. We're going to clarify what salvation looks like when the new creature is raptured up. Are they going to be in Christ after we're gone in the way of wrath or not? And what does that mean? Do they have access to the blood of Christ even though they're not a new creature in Christ? What does that mean? Do they have free will? Can they choose to fall away and still take the mark of the beast? What does that mean? Of course, these things need to be clarified. And who's God going to choose to clarify it? Probably somebody from the King James camp. Thank you for tuning in. This is James with the Underground Church Channel.